chapter 2 and verse 12. James chapter 2 and verse 12. Hallelujah. We preach this this morning to you. <clears throat> so I won't re-preach it in detail again tonight, but I need to go back over the verses and uh, then bring the Word of God uh, to the church as a whole tonight. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. If you have it, say praise the Lord. All right, James chapter 2 and verse 12. Now, this section, again, it deals with, uh, verse 14 really begins the new section where it says, What doth the prophet, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? That's really where the new section begins. But we back up a little bit into this uh, few verses and get, pick up a very key verse that deals with the judgment that is going to take place in the future that we will stand before God and be judged for the believer it will be a judgment by the law of liberty you'll enter into the freedom of God and rejoice over judgment but if you are not a true believer a true believer with evidence that means that you have the works that prove that you are a true believer then that judgment will be a judgment of terror and that is not the one that we want. We want to enter into the joy of the Lord. And we want to have the evidence that we are true believers. If you do not have works and proof that you are saved, the Bible says in the book of James, then your faith is dead. It's not only dormant, it's dead. That means it's nil and void. It does not exist. And so it's extremely important for us to understand. Uh, Paul said that we are justified by faith, not of works lest any man should boast. But then James says we're justified by works. There's no contradiction. Paul is talking about a different kind of works. He's talking about the works of the law that have to do with circumcision, has to do with keeping of the Sabbaths, the ritual ceremony aspects of the law. He says those are, those are things that Paul was talking about when he said we're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith. Now James talks about we're justified by works, but he's not talking about the works of the law. He's talking about a works that's produced by genuine faith in Jesus Christ. So there's no contradiction in the Word of God. It's just a message that's being preached to different audiences, okay? Amen. Say praise the Lord. All right, so chapter 12, of, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, Paul, uh, James says, So speak ye, that means there's a confession that you have, a confession of faith. So speak ye, and so do. Don't just have a confession of faith and not be a doer of that faith. He said you have to have the confession of the faith, but also you have to be practicing it. You have to be doing that. Amen. And so verse 13, For he shall have judgment without mercy, and hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. That's that ultimate day of judgment. Amen. Verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say, see this is a profession, of faith he has faith and have not works can faith save him the answer is no so as I said this morning you can be going to church for years and years and years and profess or confess that you are a believer but you're not now how horrible that would be to go to church for years and years and years and find out that you only had a profession or a confession that you were a believer, but in reality, you were never saved. There has to be evidence of that, that faith. Amen? By a godly, holy life. And so then he talks about, he gives us a parable here, an example. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, what are you saying to them? Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? You got you make the confession. You look at the person and say, "Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping the best for you. You know, uh, depart, be warm, be filled, but you don't do anything about it. Well, that's not helping anybody. There's no profit for the person in that day, and there's no profit for you in judgment, in the day, in the day of judgment. Okay, Amen. Because you just have a profession that you're a believer. So, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now notice it doesn't say faith is dormant. It says it's dead. If you don't have works or the reality or the evidence that you're a true believer in your life, 
then that faith is just a profession. It's dead. It doesn't exist. Amen. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. You can't do it. Because faith is invisible without works. James says, I will show thee my faith by my works. I'll make the invisible visible by the evidence or the works or the deeds in my life. Amen. That's the only way you can make faith visible is by living it. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Notice, the devil's doctrine is correct. Amen? They have a statement, and that statement is they believe that there is one God. He said, you believe in one God, you're doing well. So you can be doctrinally correct. And notice also the Bible says they tremble. They tremble. So there's a response to that. But they're not saved. So this teaches us you can be doctrinally correct. You can have a, a statement of faith, and it be correct theologically, but you can still be lost because the devil believes in one God, and he trembles at that. There's even a response from the devil to that truth. Amen. Amen. All right, let's keep going. Verse 20. Wilt thou know, O vain man, that means you're empty-headed, that faith without works is what? Is dead. And then he goes and he talks about a couple examples. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works with faith were made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. So just as 15 verse 6, the Bible says he believed God, and God accounted that belief or that faith to him as righteousness. That means right standing before God. But it wasn't until 25 years later in Genesis 22 when he offered up Isaac or was willing to offer Isaac to God that that faith became perfected or finished or complete in the eyes of God. He had the works that proved he had faith, amen, in God. And he was called the friend of God. That means he was on the side of God, not on the side of the world. Amen. Now, verse 24. Amen. Are you with me here? Amen. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Right? So you got people walking around saying, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. But if they don't live a godly, separated, holy life before God, a life that can be demonstrated, there's evidence or proof of that faith, James says they're not saved, they're not justified in the eyes of God if they don't have that proof in their life. So this is very serious that James is talking about here. Amen? And in the light of that, verse 12, it talks about uh, that we'll stand before God and be judged at that, that time. We need to know that we have to have evidence and proof of faith. When we stand before God in that final day, you better have some evidence. You better have the proof. You better have some works in your life that prove that your faith is real or not, you'll experience the terror of God instead of the liberty of God. So this is extremely serious. Amen? See, even the devil knows that you have to have works, obedience to God's Word in order to be saved. He knows that. That's why he trembles because he knows that judgment's coming and he's not ready for that judgment. He's trying to stop it from happening, but he can't do it. Amen? So when it comes to understanding the Gospel, you, must, you and I must tremble. We must fear the reality of knowing that we're going to stand before God someday in judgment. And our life better be lived in such a way that proves that we are true, genuine believers. If not, it's, going, it's not going to be a good thing for any of us. Amen. So then he goes on down. He talks about in verse 25, this woman, Rahab, and that's where I'll focus tonight. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. In the name of Jesus. Father, we come before you right now. We ask God your blessing be upon the preaching and teaching of your holy word. We give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Let us adjust our lives tonight, God, in, in repentance before your throne. If our life is not lived in a way that glorifies you, if we are not friends of God, which means we're on your side, if we have a passion for the things of this world, 
not a passion for you, God. Let us come to repentance tonight that we might be saved, justified by works, proof of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Tonight. So once again, if you will look, please, at verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. Everybody say Rahab. Now you know the story of Rahab, don't you? Okay. Well, the Bible says she was a harlot. Go to Joshua, please, in chapter 2. She was a harlot. She was an innkeeper uh, in Jericho. That city was under the sentence of judgment from God. One of the first cities uh, that when the people of God were going to go into the promised land that God declared He was going to destroy or defeat. Now, Jericho was significant because God said that that city Jericho was to be completely burned by fire. There was a, a ban, B-A-N, that was put on that, on that city. It, it was a curse. That city was full of paganism. It was full of idolatry. It was full of immorality. And as the people of God were on their way to the promised land, that was going to be the first city that God was going to judge and bring down with judgment. It is a picture in a type of the end time judgment of God. Hence, James chapter 2, verse 12, talks about the judgment that everybody will face. Amen. There's the sounding of the last trumpet, the marching around the city seven times, the collapse of the city when the trumpet is sound, the army is going over it, jumping over the walls into the city, and uh, the city is burned with fire, and anybody that takes anything out of that city is cursed by God. We know Achan took something that didn't belong to him. He took something that was cursed, and he brought a curse upon his own home in doing that. Do you understand that? Praise the Lord. But there was one woman in that city who feared God. And they had heard about what the Lord had done, how the Red Sea had been parted, and how Israel crossed over the Red Sea, and how the armies of Egypt were drowned in the sea. They heard all about that. And they look up and they see the armies of God marching toward their city. And the Bible tells us that this woman, Rahab, began to be fearful of this uh, judgment that was going to take place. So as a result of that, Joshua 2 and verse 11 tells us that she made a confession. Even though she was a pagan, idolatrous woman, a woman who worshipped many gods, this woman, who was a harlot, a prostitute, became converted. She made a profession of faith in the one true God of the Bible, forsaking the idols in her life, forsaking idolatry, forsaking her profession of a harlot, and turning to God. Verse 11 says, And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brethren, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the top wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. Amen? Now you know the story. The two spies told her to hang out the, the scarlet cord at her window. And if she hang, hung out that scarlet cord, which speaks of the blood of Jesus Christ, that scarlet cord was connected with the Passover lamb. And when they saw that scarlet cord, that that blood, if you would, typically would save her from that judgment to come. Amen. So this harlot escaped because of her faith in the one God of the Bible, 
her faith in the blood, she got out of that city before that city was destroyed. Amen. Now, she did all this by faith. I told them this morning that I believe the reason why God put her next to Abraham in this story in the book of James is significant. Because in the light of verse 12, where we will all stand before God on judgment day, what kind of judgment will it be? Will it be a judgment uh, of terror or will it be a judgment of liberty that brings salvation? And when I look at this, the Bible talks about this woman, Rahab. James is not embarrassed to call her a prostitute or a harlot because that's what she was. Now, she did not stay that way. There's no harlot, no prostitute going to be in heaven. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Only people that repent of their harlotries and repent of the prostitution that's in their life. Do you understand that tonight? So she did all of that. And so James picked her out. And he said, he didn't say just Rahab. He said the harlot. That means she escaped out of her harlotries and became a true servant of Jesus Christ, believed in the one true God of the Bible, and then proved it by her actions by hiding two spies in her house which could have brought death to her. She risked her life. So she had proof, she had works, and she had evidence that she put her faith in the true God of the Bible. She didn't just acknowledge Him as Savior. She acted on Him as Savior with proof and works and evidence. That means that her life was set apart unto God. Amen. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about another harlot. She's also called Rahab. And this Rahab I'll be preaching to you tonight about is not the Rahab of Joshua chapter 2. The Rahab of Joshua chapter 2, a once pagan idolater who escaped the punishment, the judgments of God because she put her faith in the one God of the Bible. She hung out the scarlet cord, putting her faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. She proved her faith by works, by saving the two spies. So she came out of that harlot system and she was delivered and saved in the time of judgment. There is another harlot that's called Rahab in the Bible and that Rahab will not repent. That Rahab will be judged at the judgment. That's why I said this morning that I believe that's why James picked Rahab because we have a judgment that's going on in the passage upon those who have true works, proof of salvation, which means they will have the law of liberty, versus those that will be judged, amen, in terror. So we have Rahab, the one that was saved out of the harlot system, and then we've got another Rahab that doesn't repent, that will be judged in the end times, just like the city of Jericho was judged. Okay, you with me here? All right, say praise the Lord. So, so to begin with tonight, I want to emphasize to you once again that if you and I live a life it's, which is given to filth, if we live a life of ungodliness and unholiness, we give ourselves to music that is ungodly and unholy, we give ourselves to watching television and movies that are ungodly and unholy, how can we say that we are saved? Because that's not the works of a true believer. The works of a true believer is not going to sit down and, and let their hearts and their minds be filled with filth. Movies, television, music, video games, magazines, books that you read, whatever. True believers cannot do that and say they're going to heaven. Because now, if we do that, we're no longer a friend of God. We are a friend of this world. Abraham was a friend of God. Amen? So not only what we allow ourselves to watch, listen to, what we allow ourselves to read, but the way that we dress outwardly. Amen? Either we're dressing modestly, or we're dressing like, or immodest, like a harlot. We're dressing like a bride or we're dressing like a whore. Amen. If you're dressing like a harlot, you're not going to go to heaven. You understand what I'm telling you? 
So uh, I want to begin today to emphasize these things to us because I think that we put so much focus on the grace of God that we think the grace of God is just going to cover all this stupidity that we do. Oh, no, 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 no. God calls us to live a holy and godly life. And He says, if you're a true believer, you're going to have the works. You're going to have the evidence. You're going to have the faith that you are a true believer. And if you're a true believer, you're going to be like Abraham. That means you're a friend of God. You're not a friend to the world. Say praise the Lord. So I want to begin first of all tonight. And uh, it's a little bit humorous. But at the same time, it's serious. The title of my message tonight is this. The miniskirt. The Christian miniskirt. Look at your neighbor and say, The Christian miniskirt. Okay? Now, when I said that, the Christian miniskirt, you know, it don't go together, does it? See, common sense tells you that it doesn't go together. Right? If you claim to be a Christian, wear a miniskirt, doesn't go together, does it? But I'm going to read this little little story to you. And the title of it is The Miniskirt. It's by Don W. Hillis. H-I-L-L-I-S. Don Hillis. Okay, The Miniskirt. And uh, I'm going to have to pick up part of it from my phone to finish it. But I will read it to you and I want you to listen to this story about the miniskirt. Okay? I want to make it clear that I am a Christian miniskirt. Not me. This is what the story <laughs> Now, before I get into this, I need to tell the sisters of the Lord in this church, I appreciate you. Appreciate your modesty and your godliness before God. But if any be tempted... I want to make it clear that I am a Christian miniskirt. That is, I go to church every Sunday. What's more, I attend in an evangelical church. Of course, I am not the only Christian miniskirt in town. There are many others who go to my church. Though we represent a variety of colors and patterns, there is one thing we all have in common. We all have a way of revealing attractive thighs, especially when the legs are crossed. They tell me that that's the most comfortable way to sit. Unless I am misreading the situation, we seem to make our wearer a bit self-conscious at least the girl who wears me is always tugging at my hem. Though I am not an expert on human nature, this appears to indicate some kind of complex. I have also noted that we miniskirts have the ability to attract a good deal of masculine attention, even in church. At first, I took pride in the fact that men were fascinated by my pattern and color design. However, just this morning, I heard the preacher say that this was not really what the young men and some not so young were looking at. Though I was all ears when he started to preach the appeal of the miniskirt, I was embarrassed before he was through. He claimed that the miniskirt does not appeal to the aesthetic. According to him, there are dozens of other dresses more beautiful than I am. His blanket statement that miniskirts do not make an aesthetic, academic, economic, moral our spiritual contribution to their wearers, wearers left me with feeling that I wasn't such a great Christian after all. He said the only appealing thing about me 
was my appeal to the flesh. Then he spoke for ten minutes on the carnality of human nature. He publicly accused me of contributing to the lust of the flesh. I felt a hard tug on my hem when he said that. You could have heard a pin drop in the sanctuary when he quoted the following statement from Kerry Ellett. To flaunt sexuality in public, to flaunt sexuality in public is a betrayal of your feminine, femininity, not an endorsement. It is like playing the tuba on the subway to prove that you are a musician. It isn't honest to expose a man to aroma of steak and apple pie and then accuse him of being a glutton because he licks his lips. I think everyone got the point. I really blushed when he began asking questions about what we miniskirts did when we were out in the workday world. He wondered what we thought our testimony amounted to in the presence of men who couldn't care less about our feminine purity. He said it doesn't take much to trigger a man's thought in the direction of sex. That's why Jesus said, He that looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery in his heart. The preacher claimed that there is nothing about a miniskirt that would suggest to the man on the street that the wearer's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He said that the spirit and dwelt body should be adorned in modest apparel. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10, by the way, modest apparel. The word apparel means a long flowing garment. The preacher claimed there is nothing about a miniskirt that would suggest to the man on the street that the wearer's body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He said that the spirit indwelt body should be adorned in modest apparel. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. Furthermore, he had secured some statistics from somewhere that proved that there is a vital relationship between many skirts and the increase of rape in America. I begin to feel as though I was abetting the crime wave. I suppose it is the truth that hurts. That's why I hurried out of the church this morning. I saw several other miniskirts slinking out too. I guess what we really need is to be converted into something more modest. That's the story of the miniskirt. I might add to you today that it doesn't matter if you've got tights underneath the miniskirt or you don't have tights under the miniskirt. A miniskirt is still a miniskirt. How can we as a people be going to heaven, claim to go to heaven and dress like that? How can we as the people of God indulge in the things of this world like we do, and I say we, and still claim to be going to heaven? Faith without works is dead. It's by itself. There must be in our lifestyle a life that is lived and demonstrated before this world and before the believers in the church and before angels and before God Almighty that we belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. And if it's bad to be wearing a miniskirt, 
it's much worse for you to be involved in sexual immorality. God have mercy on your soul. And I call everybody in this house tonight to forsake sexual relationships outside of marriage. Tonight. That's it. No more. We cannot claim to be Christians and be participating in this kind of lifestyle. The wearing of this kind of apparel, the immodest apparel that some women wear, some of the things that us men give ourselves to, amen, with our eyes, the lifestyles that we live and yet claim to be Christians, to be a part of that harlot system right there. You'd be surprised today how many people claim to be, be saved and on their way to heaven and living as a harlot. I tell you what awaits us if we don't get it right in our life, what awaits us is a time when we'll stand before God empty-handed. No evidence, no proof that we're saved. No evidence, no proof that we are a friend of God. I ask you tonight, do you have more evidence in your life that you're a friend of the world then you have evidence tonight that you're a friend of God. We talk about how much we love God. We, why? Because we come to church on a Sunday night. Sunday morning, a Sunday night, on Wednesday, maybe a ladies' prayer meeting. And we love God. But what about the rest of the hours in the week? How do you live? I said this morning, I said, it was a while, while back I told you I did not believe that I was preaching to anybody at that time that was lost. Because at that time we didn't have any guests in the church, but after I studied this passage uh, last night and today, I questioned that statement of that I made that day, there could be some people here tonight that are lost. Because you don't have the proof. If you're really a, a person that belongs to God, you're going to have convictions in your life. It's not because a preacher stands up and constantly, well, let's get the ruler out and let's measure the length of your skirt, you know. And are you cutting your hair or not cutting your hair? Are you wearing the right clothes? Are you, it's not because you've got a preacher doing that. It's because you've got convictions in your life. And you refuse to set those convictions aside because you belong to God. You're a friend to God. And there's not going to be any compromise in your life. Doesn't matter what the pressure of the world is to try to get you to give in, to succumb. For us to give in to the the immodest apparel. Let me tell you something, brother and sister. That miniskirt's on the rise again. It's, it's the end deal. And we Christians, or we say we're Christians. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. In my studies in my home, I have read about men who walk very closely to God that didn't have the truth that you've got and the truth that I've got. And one man, Kierkegaard, one man, I believe his name is Kierkegaard. I believe I'm putting the right uh, statement to the right person. Kierkegaard talked about the importance of, of living, living for the Lord and the emotions of the believer, things like that. And when people went out and tried to call him a Christian, he said, don't call me a Christian. He said, there's only one Christian. He said, that's Jesus. 
He didn't feel like that he was worthy to be called by that worthy name, Christian. What about us? Christianos in the Greek. Christianos means the slaves of Christ. Can we truly wear that name, Christianos, Christian, the slaves of Christ? No, I don't think so. If we're slaves to this world, you're a slave to this world. If you dress, if you wear the things of this world, if you give your heart to the thing, the entertainment of this world, and I'm not exempt. I'm preaching to myself tonight. But how can we sit down and indulge our minds day after day after day with the ungodly entertainment from carnal minds? Feed on that trash and yet come to church. I love you, Jesus. Well, we kind of like this story that I read to you today. We're Christian worldly. We're Christian worldly. Faith without works is dead, being alone. The only way that Rahab, that harlot, could get out of that city was declaring there's one God trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ, putting her life in danger to save and secure the spies. And in doing that, it wasn't just a confession or a statement of faith. She backed it up with her life, even though it meant that she might lose her life. For you to go to this world, to give yourself to this world, for me to go to this world, to give my heart to the world, to love the world is to be an enemy of Jesus Christ. I have a passion for the things of this world, passion for sports, passion for athletics, passion for the things of this world that supersede my passion for Jesus Christ. How can we call ourselves a Christian? How can you say you're a Christian, a slave of Jesus. You're a slave to the world. The problem that we have in our life is that we're not a friend of God. We're a friend of the world. Because if you're a friend of God, that means you're like Abraham, you're on God's side. Isaiah 41, the prophet Isaiah called Abraham. He was a friend of God. He walked with God. You have to make up your mind if you want to be Rahab number one, the Rahab that comes out of a city, repents of that idolatry, gets right with the one true God of the Bible. Hallelujah. Lives a godly and holy life with evidence and proof that you are a true believer, not only for the church to see, but angels to see, God to see, and the world to see. That you are a different human being. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. And that means you can't always do what you want to do. We lie to the Holy Ghost. We lie to Him. When we throw our hands up and say, I love you, Jesus. And we've given our hearts to the world. We're not friends of God. And I said, we, I'm not preaching down to you. I'm preaching to me today. How can I call myself Christian? You have to decide. Do you want to participate with the cursed thing? Thing that God is going to judge ultimately burn with fire and you want to take it into your life the Holy Ghost says it's the rewards of hell they have received and departing from the living God the word of God a holy dedicated separated life a life given to the world 
And when you do that, you'll get the rewards of hell. You walk with God by faith. You trust Him. He'll, he'll reward your obedience. But I promise you tonight, if you were to decide, I'm no longer going to live holy before God. I'm going to quit the church. I'm going to give myself to the ungodly apparel of this world. I'm going to dress like the world. I'm going to live like the world. I tell you, don't be surprised if the devil stands there and rewards you with the rewards of hell. We need to get right with the Lord. Every one of us. To be able to say, we're a friend of God. If you don't, and I don't do that, we don't come out from the world and be separate as God said. Are you hearing me? How is it that a girl can expose her legs how is it that a woman can expose her body? How is it that a woman can go against the Word of God and somehow cry, it's be all right, you know. No, it's not all right with God. The second Rahab tonight that is not going to be saved is found in Isaiah, the 30th chapter. The mighty prophet of God named Isaiah, whose name means Yahweh is salvation. In Isaiah 30, that prophet of God said this. He said, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. See, they, get, uh, they go to every counselor in the world. But they won't listen to God. Rebellious children. They take counsel, but my, they don't take my counsel. That cover with a covering, but not my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. They walk to go down into Egypt, go into the world. It's supposed to be the people of God. Going down to Egypt, going to the world. They have not asked in my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust the shadow of Egypt. Said so they're trusting in Egypt. They're trusting in Pharaoh to help them. They're looking to the world. This morning, as I said, you don't have to be concerned just about the worldly music or worldly movies, worldly television, worldly athletics. You don't have to be just concerned about that. Today, you've got to be concerned about the so-called Christian music that you listen to because a lot of that Christian music is not theologically correct. Shallow. Amen? Amen? Some of the preachers that preach today, as I said this morning in America, they got some of the biggest churches in America. They're not preaching the Word of God. They're preaching psychology. They're preaching the philosophies of philosophers. Not God's Word. You, could, I, you can't stare me down. I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to look you in the eyeball and I'm going to preach the Word of God to you. You can't stare me down. Going day after everything going after the world and saying, well, we want to make it uh, uh, you know, appealing to the world. So we want... They know you are the world. I heard a man with Hillsong, the, the lead pastor of Hillsong, he made a statement. They asked him about homosexuality. And he said, we will never be the kind of church that questions the person that's on the platform about their sexual orientation. He said, we won't ask them if they're heterosexual or if they're homosexual. We won't even ask them because we're not that kind of church. That 
is the charismatic spirit. It's not just a charismatic spirit. It's the spirit of that harlot that's riding on the back of that scarlet colored beast that says we're not that kind of church. But yet we sing their songs. And they're not all bad. Some of, I said, Sister Christine, I said, what's happened? I said, well, we used to listen to those songs, man. Some of those songs were powerful. She told me, she said, those are the older songs they used to sing. You see, they've, gone, they've gotten further and further away from solid sound theology. It is shallow stuff. Well, no wonder when you got a man that says, we don't go to question who's on the platform. That came out of his mouth. If you don't believe it, my wife will show you the, the clip. The danger in this hour is dangerous. See, and I'm a pastor. You know, I've been living for the Lord close to 40 years, pastor in this church for 25 years. And I mean, I hear some of that stuff the way they talk. Well, we love, we want to just love everybody and we're just going to accept everybody. You know, that's good. That's fine. But you've got to tell them to repent. They ask, her, ask a pastor of a, a Hillsong church in New York about what he would tell the homosexual couple. He said, I'm not going to tell you what I would say to them. Well, you ought to make a statement if you're a pastor what you would tell that homosexual couple and that is that you need to repent and get right with God. Amen. And such were some of you. But you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified. By the name of God. By the Spirit and the name. Church of the living God in America is going so far away from truth. So away from the gospel. And if you're not careful, oh, it sounds so sweet. It's so sweet they'll kiss you on the mouth. Same sex. And you know how I preach the gospel to you constantly, but it's time for me to stand up and to sound a trumpet in Zion, to sound a trumpet in this church, and I'm going to tell you again, we are not going down that charismatic road. And if you want to go that way, you're going to have to go that way. Because I am not going that way because we have to have proof on the day of judgment that what we professed was a reality that's demonstrated by a separated, godly, and holy life before Jesus Christ. I have to be careful when I listen to these so-called preachers. You have to be careful if you're going to college because those professors, friend, most of those professors, they're not believers. They are there to twist your mind, to make you carnal, to make you worldly. You better watch out. So easily captured by this world. So easily captured by this world. So are we the harlot Rahab that escapes the polytheistic paganism, the idolatries of the world before it's judged? Are we the ones that put our trust in the blood knowing, knowing our past life was like a harlot? But we put our trust in the blood of Jesus Christ and we came out of that harlotry. We came out of that idolatry. We came out of that pagan culture and that pagan society and we separated ourselves and became a part of the Israel of God. It's interesting to me that it is very, and I believe correct to say, without really, this is coming from memory, so you, if you want to go and study, you need to study to find out the validity of what I'm about to say. But this woman was so powerful in God that she married Caleb, a man who had faith. But when they went to the promised land, Caleb said, Give me this mountain. 
when he was in his 80s, he said, give me this mountain. I'll take down every giant in that mountain. I'll defeat every giant in that mountain. Give me this mountain. That man who almost 40 years before was one of the ones who entered the promised land and said, let us go up at once and possess the land for we are well able. But because of the congregation's unbelief in the Word of God, they had to wander for 38 more years. But later now, it's Caleb. He walks back in that land after having wandered with an unbelieving generation. Joshua and Caleb. Are y'all with me? Only a couple out of all of the rest of them that died in the wilderness. But he made it through that wandering with those, with that unbelieving generation. After about almost 40 years, old man in his 80s walks up and says, Give me that mountain. That mountain was full of giants, but he said, Give me that mountain. And I believe Rahab was married to that man. A woman of God, a woman of faith who came out and was spared the judgments of God. You're going to have to come out. You're going to have to make up your mind. You're going to have to come out of this world, brothers and sisters, if you're going to be saved. Say praise God. And I'm not preaching for numbers. This isn't Hillsong. Give me this mountain. An unbelieving generation dies because they didn't believe in the Word of God. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You've got to do His will. You can have the doctrine right, the confession right, you the statement right, that you believe in one God, you believe in New Testament. You can have that all right. If you don't do His will, if you don't obey the truth, you're not going to be in heaven. Because the Lord will look at you and say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, because I never knew you. Amen. Will we see you in heaven? Will you see me in heaven? It's a long journey. I don't know how much longer that I'll live, but I'm really not that old. If Jesus doesn't come back, you know. I mean, there's some, these years, man, that I'm looking at. Some of y'all are young. you got a long journey, a long walk to walk with God. you got to make up your mind. You're going to be a friend of God or you're going to be a friend of the world. You're going to get on God's side or you're going to get on the world's side. If you're a parent to young ones, to teenagers that you have, you're responsible for, you've got to look at them and you say, Oh no, not here, not in this house. You get old enough, you can do your thing, but not now. Well, explain to me, Mama. Explain to me, Daddy. Well, okay, I'll explain to you. The Bible says it. Good enough. End of story. How many of y'all really want to go to heaven? Do you have the evidence? Do you have the works, the proof that you're really saved? They went to Egypt. They went to Pharaoh for help. Verse 4, For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be a help, nor profit, but a shame and also a, a reproach. The burden of the beast of the south. The prophet says the burden of the beast of the south, that's Egypt. 
Egypt's a type of the world. Into the land of what? 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 Verse 6. Isaiah 30, into the land of what? From whence come the young and the old line and the viper and the fiery flying serpent. That's the Antichrist. The lion, the viper, the fiery flying serpent. That's Rahab. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. The prophet said, I've cried concerning this. The literal translation, Strong's Concordance, number 7293, the word strength is a translation of the word Rahab. I cried concerning, the prophet said, I cried concerning Rahab. Who's he talking about? He's not talking about the Rahab that escaped the judgment. He's talking about a Rahab who is a picture of the rebellious ones. He's talking about the flying fiery serpent. He's talking about the world government that's going to come in the future. He's talking about the Antichrist. He's talking about the woman, this harlot right here, that rides on the back of a scarlet colored beast. He said, I cried concerning Rahab. This Rahab will not repent. Their strength is to sit still. Rahab's strength is to sit still. Very quickly, keep your place in Isaiah 30. Go to Isaiah 51. Verse 9, Isaiah 51 and 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? So this Rahab that Isaiah the prophet is talking about is a picture of the dragon. It's a picture of the serpent. It's a picture of the devil. The prophet says, you cut Rahab. She's the harlot on the back of that beast. For the Egyptians shall help in vain to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. He said, you want to see a Rahab? A Rahab sits still. Rahab literally means, her name means broad. And the reason why she was called a broad was because she was a prostitute. Now the Rahab of Joshua chapter 2, she lived in the wall as a prostitute. She lived in a broad wall and she would seduce those people that were walking by to get them to join her in that prostitution. This Rahab, she escaped from that. But this Rahab, Rahab means broad. And the Bible says the way you can tell her is that she sits still. She doesn't move. She doesn't get up. She doesn't move. She doesn't aid. She doesn't help. She doesn't serve. She sits 
still. There's no movement of God in her life. She has come under the spell of a spirit. You come under the powers of the darkness of this world, the spells of that heart, and you will become immovable. You'll be seen as a person that just sits still. No more moving in God. That's Rahab. She's abroad. She sits in the broad uh, walls. And that's why they called them broad. Because the broads, or the prostitutes, sit in the broad's walls. So anybody, I, I said this before, anybody who calls you abroad, you're slapping. Because what they're calling you is a harlot. What they're calling you is a harlot. <laughs> to repeat a word that I used years and years ago when I preached. They're calling you a harlot. Hallelujah. No. I'm a part of the bride of Christ now by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm in the genealogy of Jesus Christ by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've come out of that wall. I'm no longer to sit still. I'm moving with God by the power of His Spirit. You go through the Word of God, you'll see Rahab is used. This Rahab is used for this, the term for the serpent. You get time, and I don't have time to read all these verses. Ezekiel chapter 29. Ezekiel chapter 32. Job chapter 9. Job chapter 41. I believe it's verse 34 says that uh, this Leviathan, this serpent, is over the children of pride. Ezekiel 29, Ezekiel 32, Job 9, Job 41. Read those chapters about Leviathan. Because that's who Rahab is. Read Psalm 74. And it talks about this sea monster in the sea. That's the seven-headed dragon. That's Rahab. Egypt was called Rahab in the Old Testament. The picture of world government to come. Read Psalm 87 and verse 14, and the term Rahab is used again. Give God praise. So God sends the prophet Isaiah, and he stands up there, and he begins to cry concerning Rahab. The harlot, the serpent, represents pride, represents the prostitute, represents the broad or the protection of the world. No longer moving in the Spirit of God. That woman on the back of that beast, that world government, and that woman is what the prophet's crying against. In the name of Jesus. Egyptians shall help in vain and no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. He said when it, the time to come is a term when you look it up and you study it in detail. He's talking about the end times. That this, verse 9, that this is a rebellious people. Lying children. See? Children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. 
get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. These are people who are, have itching ears. They're looking for preachers to preach to them things that are going to make them feel good. That's why they'll quit this church and go somewhere else. I declare you by the Word of God, these people have backslid against God. They backslid against the Word of God. Looking for preachers to tickle their ears. Prophesy not. Preach to us smooth things. Tell us what we want to hear. Tell us it's okay. To live in sin. Tell us, tell us it's okay to dress like we wanted to. Tell them, tell us it's okay to watch what we want to watch. Tell us it's okay to listen to music we want to listen to. Tell us it's okay. Tell us homosexuality is not that bad. Tell us that nobody's going to die and go to hell for that. Tell us what we want to hear. Breakers of covenant. Children of pride. Rebellion. Don't want the word of God. And I know you do because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Don't talk to us about holiness. Holy One. Don't talk to us about love. A so-called pastor of the church, you know, over there in New York called Hillsong Church in New York. He says, our main thing is love. Everything else doesn't matter. Misleading literally thousands of people straight to hell. Come on, somebody. Now, if, if you say, well, I don't believe that, that people leave this church backslide, then their holiness should increase. It should grow, not decrease. If they didn't backslide, they should be more godly. If they did it for good, they should be more godly. Their spirit should be not of rebellion, but of submission to the Word of God. If they were really doing it in the will of God, it should increase their holiness before God. And if it didn't, they are Rahab. Rahab. What works will they have when they stand before God? that will save them from the wrath to come. I told you many, many times, you watch a person. You watch them. They leave, they make excuses. You watch them with time. Pretty soon their cover will be blown. And who they are really in their hearts is going to start to be manifested on the outside. You will see it. I'm very bold before you because I don't want you to walk down that path. But the good news is this, is you might have been a whore, it, a hornet in the past, but you don't be a, have to be a hornet tonight. God can save you by His blood. Hang out the scarlet cord. Judgment's about to fall, but you can be delivered from the judgments of God. And rejoice over judgment in that day because you've got some proof, you've got some evidence of a godly, holy life, a life that has a passion for the Lord and not the things of this world. And if I preach the Word of God to you, for those who receive it, you're going to be strong. You're going to be powerful on the inside. You're going to have a character that's going to see, through, see you through everything the world can throw at you. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, 
because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversion and stay therein. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in, how, in a high what? High wall. Whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. He shall break it as the breaker of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare so that there shall not be found in the bruising of it assured to take fire from the earth or to take water without a pit. But thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. Get back to God. Return back to God. If you'll get back to God, return back to God. He said you'll be saved. You'll find rest. And quietness and confidence shall be your strength. The sad thing is that they wouldn't, but I believe you will. I'm, I made up my mind I'm going to. I'm te what, I, what I studied last night got a hold of this preacher's heart. Hallelujah. And I don't want you to say if you have a confession of faith. I want to put into action what I'm preaching to you tonight. I want to make some changes in my life that are necessary. Praise the Lord God. I want to clean it up. I want to get right before my God. I want to be seen as a friend of God. Yeah, the world's going to look at you as strange, but that's all right. I know what God saved me from. I was living in a world that was about to collapse. I was living in a society, a generation that had the marks of judgment upon it, the curse of God. But I escaped from that by the blood of Jesus Christ. I declare He and He alone is God. The skirts need to lengthen. The necklines need to get right. What we allow ourselves in the area of entertainment needs to be monitored strictly. What we give our hearts and our passions to we need to be turned toward God. We need to get back in His Word. We need to be reading His Word. We need to be praying, seeking God's face. How close are we to the coming judgment of God? Get back to God. Get back to God. Isaiah 51 in closing tonight. It's not time to sit still on the broad wall. It's time to have works to prove our faith. 51. And I'll start with verse 4 in closing. Hearken unto me, my people, and give unto me, give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. And mine arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me. And on my arm shall they trust. See, this is the judgment. This is a good kind of judgment. God said, I'm coming. I'm going to judge the enemy. I'm going to judge the enemy. And when I bring judgment, that means I'm going to liberate my people. The judgment for my people is a freedom, is a judgment that brings freedom to their life. If God, if Jesus needs to walk in this service tonight in this church and bring judgments against what is an enemy to Him and this Word, this Gospel in our life, thank God for it because it's setting me free from the powers of sin. It's setting you free from the powers of darkness. But let that judgment come. Let that judge come because it will liberate you and deliver you. True people of faith, it's a good thing. But on those that are the enemy terror, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath them. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. The earth shall wax old like a garment. They that dwell in therein shall die like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. And my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. The people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men, 
neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever. My salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength the arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? He's coming. He's going to defeat world government. This is the risen Lord. He's going to defeat world government. He's going to defeat the powers of darkness. Save His people. The serpent, the dragon. Art thou not it which had dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that had made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Why? Because his kingdom is established. I, even I am he that comforteth you who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and of the son of man which shall be made as grass and forgettest the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor if he were ready to destroy and where is the fury of the oppressor the captive exile hasteth that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. But I am the Lord thy God that divideth the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in thy mouth. I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. In the name of Jesus, God made a way for every one of us to come out of that, of that system like that harlot did and be saved by the blood. That's the good news. But we're not going back to it. We're not going back to the Rahab that will be destroyed. Hallelujah. I preach to you tonight the Christian miniskirt. <laughs> I think it's hilarious, honestly. I really do. It's a joke. So many times we call Christianity is not Christianity. May the Lord bless you tonight real well. Would you stand?